Ladies and gentlemen, if you could please retake your seats and ask the folks outside to come back in. We were just talking with our panel, in fact, it was one of the last questions I asked, about regulation, about government involvement, about adapting to this change from a governmental level. And so I would like to invite to the stage our panel to talk about that. The head of the European Projects and International Relations Department from the Catalan Tourist Board. Please welcome Mrs. Blanca Cross. Also, from Bosnia Herzegovina, Mizra Gulcic, the Assistant Minister of Ministry of Foreign Trade and Economic Relations. And joining us virtually, we'll get him online right now, uh, Paul Pruenkarm, who's the Chief of Staff of PATA. He's coming into us today. Where, where are you, Paul? Where? Okay, one of my favorite places. I lived there for 25 years. All right, well, welcome, everybody. That one, that was, uh, this is on now, great. So, hello. Hello, good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. It's one thing to know about the technology. It's one thing to embrace the technology. But then you've got to be in a position to understand how it applies on a governmental level so that you can adapt to the changes that are actually out there right now. So, from your perspective, what's happening in Bosnia and Herzegovina that applies to what we were just talking about? And how has it changed the way you approach the travel industry? Thank you, sir. First of all, it is my great pleasure to be here, to participate in this forum, and to be here in beautiful Seville. Um, so Bosnia-Herzegovina is a European country, and we would like to become EU member states. And uh, usually we follow all uh, the EU regulation in that, uh, that aspect. When we are talking about climate change, Bosnia-Herzegovina ratified all international instruments uh, connected with, with uh, uh, climate change. For example, uh, the UNF uh, C Convention, Convention on Climate Change, and the Paris Agreement. According to that, um, to that uh, documents, uh, uh, we need and we already um, adopted the set of uh, uh, policy documents, uh, regulations, plans, reports, and we fulfill our obligations. But um, there is always question of the implementation of that document. And for, um, uh, let's say, small countries like Bosnia and Herzegovina is with uh, small capacities, it is uh, very hard to, to, to work on the field, to implement all policies, uh, and to be, to be su successful. Well, it all gets down to the money. Yes, of course. It does. I mean, let's go back to the Paris Accords that so many countries said they supported and then violated, yeah. right? I mean, and, or basically said, we'll be exempt, yeah. right? Let's talk, you know, China, India. I mean, if you take a look at just CO2 in China, I mean, you know, you take a look at those levels, they, they have signs every day telling you how unaccept, not whether or not they're acceptable, about how unacceptable they are. So what is the, what's the purpose of having benchmarks and deadlines and milestones if there's no real application to doing it? Uh, that's a real question, and it is very hard to, to, to answer because uh, usually small countries, we have uh, uh, on, on the global uh, level, small impact on, on climate change. But uh, everyone uh, experienced uh, effects of the climate change. So uh, let's say uh, the, the, the biggest issues is with, with the biggest countries, and they have obligation to really to do something. But uh, it is not <laughs> so easy to say we will adopt some kind of law and we will implement it in the ne next period. You're Although the argument could be made that as a, a, the smaller countries are more manageable, um, that you have a better handle on what your problem is and a ba uh, maybe a better way, a better path forward to, so to, to solve it. I think that the uh, answer is in, uh, in cooperation between private sector and, and uh, 
public service, let's say, uh, to have new initiatives, to have a new innovation, and, and to, to adopt that, that, uh, that approach. So give me an example, if you can, of that public-private partnership in Bosnia-Herzegovina that you've been able to do. Um, uh, for example, now uh, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina is a popular destination because we have Olympic mountains and now we have a problem with, uh, with snow, so there is... And you're, and you're not alone. Yeah, and um, how to, to cope with that problem, um, so we have a, a good analysis from the, from the private sector companies and they, they are coming to us and, and uh, to, to the... To, um, public companies and, and um, promote new new technology, which is uh, uh, environmental friendly and which is also in line with, with all obligations that country made. Are you talking about ski resorts? Yes, I'm talking about ski resorts. Okay, what what is that technology? Uh, artificial snow. <laughs> <laughs> not, a, but produce. that's not new technology. Uh, yes, it's technology. It's very complicated uh, because. Um, it is not just to have new, new snow, artificial snow. You need to, to, to produce the snow also for, for natural snow and to mix it if you want to have uh, better uh, ski, ski uh, tracks, if you want to have um, a longer season for skiing and, and something like that. Of course, there's an environmental aspect to that as well, which goes beyond whether or not people are going to be able to ski down the mountain, and that is the natural cycle of nature. And that is, if you don't have snow, next thing you know, you have drought. Next thing you know, you have wildfires. Yeah. And it, it, it continues. We've seen this in so many countries. Uh, we've even seen it in states like California. Uh, so do you have a plan then? We have a plan. So we adopted uh, the National Adaptation Plan. And uh, that plan uh, recognized tourism sector as one of the sectors which is hit by the climate change. So in that uh, document, we have a set of measures what we need to do to, to fight against uh, climate change. And it's costly. That's, that's the, the name of the game. Uh, unfortunately, without strong support from the EU and other international donors, such as, uh, for example, USAID, which I, I'm taking this uh, opportunity to thank them for great support providing Bosnia-Herzegovina with, with uh, uh, wonderful project called USAID Tourism. So without, uh, without support from, from uh, the biggest, richest country, uh, it is very hard to, to fight against climate change and to adapt. On of course, change. you're not just fighting against climate change, you're fighting to preserve your business. Yes. <laughs> and, and there's the double-edged sword there because if you don't get that support, the ski resorts can't operate, forgetting the, the impact on, on the environment, and the next thing you know, jobs are lost, economic base disappears, and you have nowhere to go. Yes, and there are so many direct and indirect impacts on tourism. For example, uh, 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 price of food is going to be higher and higher. Uh, price of energy, price of, uh, I don't know, on human health, of everything. Everything is connected with tourism. And, and what we don't want to see is uh, tourism mobility, to, 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 to see that tourist in another country. So we want to... to, to How are you them. positioning this with your own population, with your own citizens, as a sustainability issue or as an economic one? Uh, you have only hard questions. Do you have something? <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> uh, uh, as I mentioned, with, with great support, Support from uh, international experts. We have some analysis and some uh, recommendations uh, what what we have to do in the future. But uh, uh, with policymakers, for example, I'm policymaker, but I'm not a decision maker. <laughs> so ministers and government, they are decision makers. Uh, usually we prepare. You're a policy suggester. Yeah, yeah that's better word. Uh, so usually we prepare everything and send them and, and say we need to have, I don't know, some sort of money to, to finance some activities. Uh, and they say, oh, it's not priority in this moment. We have to finance something else. And that's, that's our real problem. So it is hard to, to answer. Sustainability is, is very important, but, uh, but there are always some priorities, 
especially for, for ministers, for their campaigns, and, and etc. Well, is there a campaign on sustainability in Bosnia-Herzegovina? Is somebody running on that? Uh, it's, how to say, always um, important part of ho all projects to have that uh, sustainability component. Uh, but unfortunately, um, sometimes it's not, it's, it's not like that. If I were to walk on the, on the streets of Bosnia-Herzegovina today and ask a local citizen, what's the, what's the most cr pressing environmental uh, issue today? Would they talk about snow on the mountain? Uh, sorry. If I asked a, a local citizen today, yeah. it's about the flow of information and educating your own people. Uh, what's the most pressing environmental issue in Bosnia-Herzegovina today? Would they say snow on the mountain? Uh, probably not. They will, they, will choose, uh, they will choose another topic. It's uh, Trgovska Gora, radioactive uh, nuclear disposal close to the border of Bosnia and Herzegovina. It's at the same, uh, on the can same you, border. Can you hold the microphone just a little closer? Sorry, sorry. Yeah. So it's uh, close to the border of Bosnia and Herzegovina, and our, our neighbors, Croatia, they are building the, that uh, disposal for radioactive uh, waste. So and that's the biggest issue, and it's very interesting for NGO sector, politicians, uh, business sector, for, to, to everyone. And it's a real issue for us. So basically what you're talking about is radioactive snow on the mountain. Uh, that's another... Or the potential. Mm, no, I hope that that kind of disposal will be 100% secured. And <laughs> the reason and why I'm asking that question is to talk about have you positioned these issues as crises, or, have, or are there just things you'd like to do? Uh, as I mentioned, we had so many plans, so many analysis, and uh, we predicted some, some things, but uh, usually we are fighting with, with uh, results of something, and that's the problem. So have you made progress with the snow on the mountain? Yes, yes. Is there snow on the mountain? Yes. Not uh, now, but in uh, December, January, February, and March, you can ski and enjoy in, in our beautiful uh, resorts. And the last question before we move on, what about cost? Because you now have the support, you're getting the aid, you have the technology. What is that doing to the cost of someone's travel experience to go skiing on the mountain? Can you still stay competitive? Uh, <laughs> we are trying to be competitive. But um, it is not easy because, for example, price of the energy is, is doubled in the, in, the, in the last year. So um, we have some other offers, some other services that we can offer to, to tourists. And uh, still food, drinks are cheap and entertainment in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So, so uh, maybe it could be a new destination for, for new tourists. And uh, our goal is to, to, to have tourists to stay more than two days in, 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 in Bosnia. That's always the challenge of any Minister of Tourism anywhere in the world, number of days. Yes. So at the same time, though, you bring up an interesting point, and that point is how do you stay competitive with, this, with climate change and sustainability issues costing you so much money? I don't know, because some effects we will know after, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 years, but in this moment, uh, we, we have good will and we are doing something. But what will happen in, in the next period, it is, it is hard to predict. And of course, you can't discuss any of these issues without talking about the power and the impact of travel and tourism on GDP, on basically you know, right here in, in this area, right, Blanca? The, your GDP relative to travel and tourism, I can only speak, at least from the American market, if you ask Americans where their favorite places are to go, it's gonna be Spain, it's gonna be France, it's gonna be Italy. You know why? Because Americans are all failed art history majors. We, we studied the paintings in school, we figured we'd better go see it. But going beyond Bilbao, and going beyond the Prado, and going beyond what you have here in Seville, you still have to deal with climate change. So how are you doing that? So, well, you have to take into account that in our region in Catalonia, we are from the Catalan Tourist Board in charge of the promotion of Catalonia. 
Um, Hold the mic just a little closer. Yes, yes. like this? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> so I want them to hear you. Tourism means 12% of the GDP of our region, so it's quite important. I will say very important. And when we were facing the pandemic in 2020, we realized that 800,000 families were indirect or direct depending on tourism. So taking into Is that mind, the first time you realized that? <laughs> yeah, in fact, because it's when uh, all hotels, they closed down, you know, there was all this uh, situation. And uh, you, uh, the population in our region is 7.7 .7 million people, 800,000. So um, I think it's very important that we take very serious uh, any, any issue that uh, can affect tourism, that can be climate change, can be any crisis, any pandemic, anything. But I would like also to explain to you that in 2018, uh, in Barcelona, we launched the Barcelona Declaration. It was better places to live, better, pl better places to live, better places to visit. So that what we intend is uh, in that moment to, to focus our strength to see what we can do with the over tourism in some destinations as Barcelona and the coast in our case, okay? So after that, uh, in this declaration, we also we were facing environmental issues that we Su were- Such as? Such as uh, snow. Go back to snow. Uh, yeah, so now is very clear. Uh, so now we have arrived to a point this summer that uh, for example, droves, there's no, no rain in our region, no rain at all. So uh, there are a lot of elements that are affecting in the climate change and will affect, you know, our, our tourism and also the, how we are going to organize, how are we going to, uh, to face all this new situation because it is clear that with this summer uh, heat wave every two, week, two weeks, it means people, they will not come. But of course, it will mean that the season will enlarge you know, in October, because it's still October, now you can go with t-shirts, and there is uh, no rain, and it's sunny. So, uh, it's a, a new scenario. Well, from an economic perspective, it allows you to extend your season. We've seen this all over Europe. We've seen this in America as well, with, you know, 30 days of 100 degree plus weather, unheard of. Um, and, you know, it's nice to say you have summer all year round, but you can't look at it in a vacuum, because there's another price to pay. Right? Sorry? There's another price to pay. If you, it's yeah. one thing to say we're extending the season, but if there's yes. no water, the season's going to end pretty fast. And of course, we are, as Catalan Tourism Board, we are administration, and the General Directorate of Tourism of Catalonia is the one who, who does the policies in tourism. Uh, we do the promotion, they do the policies. Uh, they launch the national commitment for uh, responsible uh, tourism. What means a national commitment? Means to go through all the ecosystem, all the sector, public, private, academic, even those so, uh, civil society, everybody, to build a roadmap all together for the following years. So this has been done now. So give me an example of what that policy now means. Uh, for example, to first to build that, we had to take all these experts from different fields, from economy, agriculture, civil society, everything, to see. And they actually have to start talking to each other. Yeah, to start talking to each other in the same table. And then they had to focus what they expected for Catalonia in the next years from the tourism perspective. For it was from different fields. So just they start to do a uh, brainstorming. After that, we collect all these ideas and with the private sector, public sector again, academic, and as well the uh, um, civil society, uh, we discuss what is really, really, what we really can do. And after that, we have about 77 activities or initiatives that we have to develop for the next 10 years, you know, for the following years. So give me an example of one of those 77 activities that is actually doable. Yeah. We can link some of these activities to the uh, Climate Action Plan. Uh, we also signed the Glasgow Declaration. Right, but, but, give yeah. me, but give me an idea of what one of those activities Yeah, for is. example, water. Uh, at this moment, the reservoir of water, the reservoir of water is 20% in our region. That's terrible. It's terrible. So, and it's also, there are studies that say in our region, uh, the tourists spend the double water that the local ones. 
So, and that's always the case, not yeah, just here. We are 7.7 .7 million, and we receive 23 million tourists. So uh, it is needed a plan for the water. So in this, one of the activities we have to do, there is uh, everything related to training, everything related to, to see um, how uh, the industry can reduce water through efficiency, through uh, any other systems in that sense. So, and also... Um, Let me stop you there on that. Yeah. Take a look at how many hotel rooms you have with that many people in those hotel rooms, showering, flushing toilets, drinking water. That's not going to stop. You, can't, you don't educate hotel guests by saying, or maybe you do. Yes, I think we can, because yesterday there was a team here from the South African Tourist Board. He explained uh, how, what they are doing. I think it's very interesting. I think this sort of for, these forums, like this one, is the place to exchange this information. So after that, I spoke to him because... You, you talk about Tim from Cape Town. Uh, Cape Town, yeah. yeah. So after that, uh, uh, Kim, uh, Tim, he also explained, we, for example, we are focusing only to the travel industry, and to the tourists, you know, to, to be aware of all of that. But them from, uh, from South Africa, from Cape Town, they are focused also to the tourists. And I found this very, uh, to the residents, sorry. And I found this very important, that this is not uh, contemplated in our plan. So I think that I'm going, you know, to explain, because it's a work in progress. Okay, so it's one thing to explain that your reservoir levels are at 20%. Now what are you asking your residents to do? Now we are not asking to the residents from the Catalan and the tourism. We are just working with the, the tourism oh. industry. All right, so what are you asking them to do? We are, no, we're just starting first uh, to see which are most efficiency, um, sorry, I'm not in charge of that, but uh, they are looking which are the manners to, um, um, to, to save water. So for example, yeah, in your example on the snow on the mountain, you're looking for new technology to create that, right? To create artificial snow to replace that. What technologies are you looking at? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'll, give, I'll, give, you, I'll, I'll give you an example. Yeah, yeah, but for example, relating to also to ski resorts. Yes. It's the same. We have the same problem. There is no snow. So uh, one of the activities is to convert these ski resorts into ski mountains, uh, a ski mountain resort to forget about the snow. Non-technology, what we are going to do. For to do this technology, you need more water to create artificial snow. So, to so you're not going to do that? In that sense, no, we are going, our, uh, our focus is to, to transform these ski resorts in a ski mountain. Resort means more activities all year long. So we're talking only. zip lines coming. Sorry? We're talking zip lines, <laughs> so to speak. Right, but the thing is, as you and I discussed, it all has a cost. It all has a cost. The people who visit this region are only going to be here for how many days per person? Three, four? No, three. Okay. So educating them is a challenge because they're going to go home, right? It's the people who have to live here and who want to live here and want to survive who have to come up with those solutions. But we also we foreseen that this tourist that just came for three days to stay longer. And, uh, there but if they stay longer, they're going to use more water. Yeah, but also depends. Uh, well, if we look for this uh, sustainable uh, way of life, or for example, a slow tourism. No, we are focusing now also in the slow tourism that Kat also has talked about it. It's a way of life that people are very conscious because it's very important that the people, we are people, we are the person who travel, we are the tourists, we are conscious about the consume, we, are con we should be conscious of what we are doing and what the damage that we are provoking when we are going to a place. So we have to be responsible. And this is very individual and we have to reach the individual to realize of that. And it's a big challenge, but we can do it, little by little, but we can do it. For example, just an example. Uh, in our case, what we have uh, started to do is, in the Catalan Tourist Board, there are 70 people working in Barcelona and outside. So, and in the General Directorate, I don't know how many people, but more, more or less maybe the same, to start to train all these people to know exactly when we are talking about sustainability, what means. What we are talking about these attitudes, what it doesn't mean, what responsible tourism, what is this um, national 
a commitment for responsible tourism? What means if we sign the Glasgow Declaration? Because sometimes politicians, they do. But it's important, you know, to go to, to land all these. Well, you've got to go from mission statements to action. Yeah. Yeah. Now, let me change gears here and talk to Paul in Thailand. Hello, Paul. So at Pata, I mean, you're doing a lot of activity in Singapore and Bangkok or Thailand and Brunei, in Malaysia, uh, in, in Indonesia. In listening to our conversation, what are your specific sustainability challenges and how, and, and we can even talk just climate change alone, and, and what, what actions are you taking? Well, Paul, you talked about small wins. Can you give us a good example in any one of the countries we mentioned where you've had that victory and give an example of what you've done? any new licenses for logging in primary forests and peatlands um, and monitoring and evaluation of existing permits and land use. Well, um, you know, Blanca was just talking about educating local residents and educating the people who actually live in those communities. You're in Bangkok right now. Can you give me a good example of how you've educated local residents of the city there so they understand the, the cause and effect relationship that, that contributes to climate change? Yeah, you know, we just, uh, we launched uh, last year, we launched our tourism destination resilience uh, program. So it's really focusing on how to make destinations more resilient. And there we actually did uh, five pilot projects, you know, one of them in Thailand, just training people, especially industry stakeholders on the importance of resilience and how it's tied into sustainability and the importance of that, right? Because, you know, we're seeing, of course, uh, more frequent storms, floods, uh, they're severe, more severe. So just having those one-on-one -on -one trainings um, in, in Bangkok or in places like Bali, Jakarta, um, Philippines, um, Cambodia, 
is that small wins that were, were small steps we are taking to just educate local stakeholders on the ground. You know, if we, if we expand the definition of, of climate change to talk about weather disasters, we're seeing, you know, seasonality start to disappear. Uh, we're seeing, you know, hurricane season doesn't start now in September. It starts in June uh, in, in the United States. Typhoon season where you are is now seeing a much wider calendar year. Uh, how do you prepare for that in terms of all those other things you talked about? Because they're all interconnected, whether it's supply chain, lifestyle, and of course we haven't mentioned hospitality industry of, of all the visitors that you have. Well, I think it's, first of course, it's educating people on, on you know, why this is happening. You know, a lot of people, of course, you know, they're, they're not as educated on the fact that these severe storms and more frequent storms and changing weather patterns are, are because of climate change and, you know, our effects on that. Um, so that, that's the first step. Second is understanding how to, you know, build resilience to those, um, those severe storms and, and natural disasters that are happening. Um, and that's, you know, that's the program that we're really focusing on now, because then, then that will lead to things like sustainability and, and looking at, you know, something like reducing food waste or uh, reducing single-use plastics. Um, but it's, it is small steps. And our Tourism Distance Resilient Program has been expanding. You know, first we started at, uh, at, a, at, the, government, at the government level. Now we're starting more, more towards the SME sector, which actually leads a lot more education, um, especially in light of recovery um, from the pandemic. You know, we were talking before, in the case of Bosnia-Herzegovina, of the public-private partnerships. Uh, what are you doing in that area, uh, working especially in, in the hospitality industry and the travel industry, to create those public-private partnerships that can actually attain some of those goals? Well, I think the, a lot of times what we're seeing here is that, you know, the, the two sides aren't really talking to each other, right? You have the, the, the public side, the public sector saying one thing, the private sector saying another thing. Um, well, let me stop you right there. Let me stop you right there. Yeah. What's the public sector saying that the private sector doesn't agree with? Well, I think the importance of sustainability sometimes, right? I mean, you have the, the a lot of governments here across the board saying how important sustainability is. But on the private sector side, right, they're, they're, of course, right now, as we're coming out of recovery, um, they're just looking to recoup their, their, their finance and the revenues from the, you know, from the pandemic. So sustainability for them is on the back burner. On their, on their side, the public, the, on the public sector, sustainability is, is, is a big focus for a lot of destinations across the board. So then how do you bridge those two gaps and, and make sure that they're both on the same page? Well, let's that's go where, back, yeah. that's where part of part, provides a platform for that to happen. You know, it's interesting. If you go back be, right before the pandemic, the two items that were topic A in the travel industry were over-tourism and sustainability. And my guess, and by the way, I was wrong, uh, was that after the pandemic, people would forget about both of them. Well, actually, they didn't forget about sustainability. I think they did forget about over-tourism. We still It's worse than ever right now. Uh, but in terms of sustainability, you're saying you're continuing the conversation and you're giving it a much more enhanced status. Is that right, Paul? Of course, and we're also working with uh, a lot of our countries here to, 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 to work with them on their plans, to, you know, how to make the, the industry more resilient and sustainable moving forward. I'm providing toolkits, providing uh, resources for them, case studies, um, for them to sort of you know, learn from each other, right? Because every destination in this region is unique. They'll all have their own different challenges um, and opportunities to address these, uh, address the future challenges that we see. Is there one country in particular you can give us as a, as a case history uh, or as a case study of where they've been able to enact a good plan? That's a, that's a tough one, right? Um, you know, it, it, it's a, it, it is a tough one. I said Singapore does have a good plan moving forward. I mean, for them, it is easy. I think um, the, the gentleman from, uh, from Bosnia and Herzegovina said, you know, to, because of smaller countries, it makes it easier for them to, to really focus on, on achieving um, long-term plans. Uh, excuse me. You know, so their plan is, is for, you know, by, is the Singapore Green Plan for 2030. So really, they're, they're, it's easier for them to really just hone in and get all the, all the stakeholders across all sectors 
onto the same plan. So when I said, you know, looking at green financing, sustainable job creation, um, reducing waste to landfills by 30%, um, planting trees, 1 million trees by 2030, you know, that's an easier goal to achieve for such a small destination like Singapore. Well, if Singapore can move as quickly as this as they move to ban chewing gum, there may be hope in the world, right? That's how fast they move. So well, yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> and and it's, you know, it's it, the other other countries will take note, right? Because it is, you know, while we're all in the same boat together, there is competition between um, one another. Um, so you know, if they if if you know other destinations see Singapore really taking a lead in that in that particular direction, the other countries will definitely start stepping up. Um, you know, try to catch up to Singapore. Well, drawing from that, are you leading the way for other countries of your size in the region? Uh, so uh, in the region, we, we can say that have good cooperation, um, especially in environmental sector, uh, because uh, in the European Union, there is, a, uh, let's say, a new approach called EU Green Deal, and all uh, countries from the region, Western Balkans countries, uh, they adopted a uh, green agenda for Western Balkans. So we are following EU, uh, EU uh, strategy, how to de develop to be, to, to be uh, how to say, uh, to have sustainable de development uh, based on uh, green technologies, uh, decarbonization, um, improvement, improvement of biodiversity, etc. Also in tourism sector, we had that kind of uh, cooperation, but it is, uh, let's say, not de developed like in other sectors because uh, a key communitaire in tourism sector is not developed uh, or, or there is no push from the European Union to, to, to uh, do it on the regional level. So um, thanks uh, to the, some projects uh, that we have, uh, uh, in, we, we promote regional cooperation, we exchange uh, data, uh, we uh, have uh, bilateral agreements um, in tourism with all neighboring countries, with uh, Serbia, Croatia, Montenegro, and and um, again, I need to to to, to mention that uh, we need more implementation, not to wait for, for problems and then to talk about them. We need to 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 uh, uh, work before problems comes. And are you doing that? Uh, as, as, as uh, let's say, expert, I can say no, but as assistant minister, I, I have to, to say <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what's the real answer? Uh, unfortunately not. We have communication, uh, let's say, once per few meetings per year where we can discuss about some issues, but it is not, uh, how to say, with not real effects on, 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 on the industry, on the business sector. And Blanca, here in this region, are you leading the way for other countries to follow? Yeah, uh, in fact, we are members of a network that is next door. It's the network for European regions working for a sustainable and competitive tourism. So in that uh, network, uh, they have cre created, uh, well, yeah, they are, in way, uh, they are creating a hub in climate change. But uh, at the same time, we are doing some exchanges of good practices, best, but bad practices as well. So it's a, a point, a hub, where we can share. And uh, all we as administration, we are facing a lot of challenges. It's not easy. It's not easy with the private sector. It's not easy to understand that sustainable, OK, for them means more cost, more cost, more cost. But also it means long term benefits. Um, benefits for them, okay? So uh, we collaborate with all of them. Uh, not all the regions of Europe are in next, uh, in next tour, but some of the main regions that uh, receive more tourists are there in next tour. So it's a, it's a place where we meet and we can exchange on that. For example, when I was talking about the, uh, the national commitment for responsible tourism, it's been two years of discussion with the the business sector. It was not just draw, okay, let's do like that. No, two years of discussion with the sector, with academics, with the, um, the, um, the work trade as well, uh, very important, and also the civil society. So now 
yeah, we have a region agreement that have been signed for more than 170, you know, associations of all Catalonia. But now we are doing the operational plan. So, for example, we are checking what Scotland, Scotland has something similar, what they are doing in that sense, how we are going to this operational. To what we have achieved now has to be land in from now to 2030. So that's, and thanks to the other experiences, it helped us to go on. And is the private sector on board? In this, uh, in this uh, network, is not on board. But in the national, in our region, they are on board. But they all have to be on board. Yeah, not all of we, almost all of them. It's been really difficult. I was not in the negotiation <laughs> with all of them, but I know that it's been very hard. So most of them, but still there are some people that when we talk about sustainability, when we talk about climate change and that we need to adapt and we need to mitigate and this, they are scared. They, they, want, they don't want to listen. They don't believe on that. It's still there. They don't believe in that with 100 degree temperatures. Okay. Yeah, but they will see how the weather affects when the, you know, the change, the trends, uh, the trends in tourism and everything. They will see it. Yeah, but that may be too late. Yeah, that's why we have to push now. And on that note, let's all push now. Mr. Minister, Blanca, Paul, Kapkunka, thank you for joining us. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank our panel. Thank you. And I'm told that we're now gonna take a 10 minute break. Please be back, look at your watches for our next panel in 10 minutes. Thank you very much.